finding a couple of pieces of information that I needed. Um, for all of those of you who are already tuned in, I might as well take this time to introduce myself. Um, my name is Danny Potter. Um, I'm, uh, I have a degree in psychology emphasis in neuropsych, uh, working towards a graduate degree uh, to uh, become a, a psychological uh, therapist, a uh, clinical mental health therapist, or a number of different names for it. Essentially, I want to work with people on uh, how to change their brains according to the way they like to live. Um, that's that's about it. Um, I'm sorry I don't have a, a, a presentation ready for you. I had a rather hectic week uh, with a lot of my clients and uh, didn't have a whole lot of time to to donate to get me like a PowerPoint presentation. But I kind of figure, honestly, it might be a little bit easier if, if you see me uh, anyway, and I can talk, and move my hands, and you know you can know who you're talking with. Um, I'm just gonna take a second to make sure that I've got this thing running. Uh, by going to my YouTube channel, making sure that it's up. We got about two minutes before we're going to really get going. Okay. Um, my writing resume. Um, I won the first annual Forget the Fairy short story contest, where we do a um, a twisted fairy tale, um, and I am turning that into a novel. Um, I've had interest from it from Jolly Fish Press, uh, Cedar Ford, and Creature House Publishing, although I decided that none of them were quite right uh, for the the type of market that I'm looking at. Um, um, so anyway, uh, I uh, was professionally a writer for a game uh, with University of Maryland, BYU, and, um, and NASA and the National Science Foundation, and, and it was... Uh, Creating a game, an educational game to teach kids science. It was called Dust. Uh, not very widely heard of, but boy, it was a lot of fun to make. Okay. All right, about just under a minute to go now. All right. It looks like we're actually running. Um, I forgot this is on a little bit of a lag, so I'm actually probably a little bit late. Sorry about that. Uh, hopefully, all of you are uh, are seeing this well. All right. So um, I'm going to talk today about using neuropsychology in your writing, um, and this is something that I'm, I'm deeply passionate about. Um, I, I study brains for a living. I, I went through uh, five or six different uh, majors uh, before I settled on psychology, uh, and I, I studied almost everything that you can think of. Um, and I ended up deciding that the part that I was most interested in was the human aspect of everything. And so I decided to study humans, um, and I discovered it's it's vitally important to to reading and writing, uh, because it's all about the way that we interpret things. It's all about the way that we uh, see things. If you want to know how to make a human feel something, well, you've got to know the psychology of the individual. Uh, if you want to know how to explain a very complex concept briefly, you need to understand how we examine things in our mind, how we learn things and absorb new information. And uh, I I was at LTUE. If if None of you have gone to LTUE. I highly recommend it. It uh, stands for Life, the Universe, and Everything. And it's a, uh, um, a conference that's held here locally in uh, in Provo, Utah. Um, well, here locally for me, wherever you are. Um, but uh, it's, yeah, while I was there, I, I took a class from a guy who very openly admits he's gone, gone through a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and he learned a lot about uh, cognitive psychology and the way that our brains work and things. Like, it's... Why aren't we applying this to, to writing? And uh, it was kind of an explosion in my mind. Now, if we want to know how to write a book that will be fulfilling, a book that people want to read, a book that's gripping, uh, then we need to know why people read. We need to know what they're reading for, what they're looking for in a book. And so as I kind of began to examine that, um, th there are tons of different theories as to why we read books, why we enjoy fiction. 
uh, and why we enjoy speculative fiction like fantasy and, and things along those lines. Why we enjoy books about uh, like real world drama and people that we don't know and their relationships and their problems. I've got problems enough of my own and relationships enough of my own. Why would I go and read something else like that? Um, well, what I've what I've got uh, my my general theory. Um, is uh, you know, let me start in a different place. Actually, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit scattered at the moment. Um, so, brief overview of what I'm going to talk about. First of all, what we look for in books. Uh, second of all, you don't really want them to read your story. You want your story to play out in their mind. You don't just want them to be being told a story. You want them to be living it along with the characters. And we're going to discuss how we do that and what the difference is. Um, you want them to be emotionally involved in and emotionally feeling it with the characters, not just reading that the characters experiencing an emotion and then them just you know being removed from that. You want them to to live the story along with your your characters, both physically, emotionally, uh, in in image and everything. Um, you uh, want to be able to know how to describe things clearly. And now everything that I go through is 100% factually, universally true except when it isn't. <laughs> um, with psychology, there is no universal. Every single person is different, and every single brain uh, adapts slightly differently to, to different things. What we're going to be talking about is averages. I'm going to be saying people are like this, people expect this, and this is averages. Almost every time I stand up in front of a, an audience and start saying people are like this, or men think this way, or, or uh, people like this, well, they do, except the ones that don't. Um, so this is all averages. This is usually, this works... Uh, and, and usually this is the way that people respond. And second is something that Brandon Sanderson said uh, when uh, I, I, I was in his uh, creative writing class at BYU. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, if, if you know the, the Stormlight Archives or uh, the Reckoner series from Mistborn, or dozens of them, he's been number one on the New York Times bestseller list a number of times, and he's, uh, he's, he's an excellent author. Um, and he, he says that uh, there is pretty much no universal rule in writing. You just need to understand why the rule exists, and as we all know, rules are made to be broken, and you need to know how, how to break them. So, keeping that in mind, um, let's, let's proceed on with, with the psychology of the individual and the neuropsychology of, of writing and of reading. Um, to be able to understand books and, and us in relation to books, um, let me just sum up the reason why we're the number one dominant life form on the planet. Um, this is a snurk, okay? Snurks go scree. This is a pip. Pips go boop. Now, which goes boop? You just said it was this one. And you might not have remembered it was called a pip, but there was something interesting that you just did. Because what you just did, you didn't think that you interpreted anything or, or went to great lengths to figure out which one goes boop. But no animal in the world except for human beings can do that. We can come up with dogs that can paw out the alphabet. We can come up with gorillas that know sign language. We can come up with parrots that actually seem to understand some of the words that they're saying. But none of them, despite having capability for language, can connect what you just did. The thing was, I gave you three points of a triangle. I gave you... a, a a name and a, uh, a behavior. Uh, sorry, yeah, I give you a, a visual and a behavior, and then a name and a behavior. So I said, this is a pip. Pips go boop. I didn't connect those two for you. I didn't say this goes boop. You connected the visual and the the uh, the behavior by yourself. I gave you the one and the other, and you connected the third without even thinking about it. Now that seems like the simplest thing in the world. Except that your brain doing that without thinking about it, it has learned something. It has connected uh, a cause and effect and made relationships. That's why we like to read. Because in the wild, we can't run faster. We can't uh, fly. We can't swim better than everything else. Uh, we, can't, uh, we're not, we don't have the most natural weapons. We don't have venom. We don't have uh, fangs. I mean, we, we're pretty strong. We're pretty fast. We can swim pretty well. We're very adaptable, we're a jack of all these trades, but a master of only one. And that is no other animal in the world can think as well as we do, can connect cause and effect, and can learn. So, you know, we're running along and we bonk our head on a rock, and we all of a sudden go, wait a second, maybe if I use this rock and bonk that saber-toothed tiger on the head with it, 
something will happen. So we connect it in different relationships, in different ways. Um, so um, this is behind the reason why we read. In order to be equipped to survive this life, we need to use that information. We need to gain more information. Um, it's kind of like uh, um, the little robot in Short Circuit, if any of you have seen that old movie. Uh, he, he gets rebooted, and he's he's got some glitches with him. He ends up being very human and all these other sorts of things. But he walks around going, input, need input. Your brain is constantly doing that. It's constantly rewiring itself according to the new information that you're getting second by second, what you're focusing on, things that you don't even realize that you're learning. Just like you didn't realize that you were connecting something I wasn't telling you, which is that this goes boop. You know it's a pip, you know pips go boop. But you connected that. Now, as you read, some part of your brain is applying the information it's learning, figuring out how to use it in life, uh, figuring out how this is a new perspective. The best way to think of our mind is it's essentially like a hive mind. Your conscious mind didn't have to work out that this goes boop. That happened unconsciously. This is happening constantly. You're monitoring sounds that are around you right now. And if something is out of the ordinary, if something is, if everything all of a sudden goes suspiciously quiet, or if there's suddenly a, a strange noise in the background, you'll hear it. You have all of these, we call them cortices, like these subdivisions of your brain. It's basically a hive mind. And uh, it gives us information at our conscious level only when we think we need it. So we don't realize we're actively learning any time that we're reading anything, any time that we're paying attention to anything. Every single bit of information that comes to you through your senses, uh, your brain learns from it. So we read so that we can learn. We read so that we can interact better with the world around us. Uh, we feel really a, a sense of satisfaction and pleasure when we feel growth and progress. So when we see a character grow, or when we see a character progress, or the good guys make some progress in, in the right direction, or something along those lines, we feel good. It makes us feel good. We read so that we can see other people overcoming situations that might be similar to ours. It gives us more hope for our own situation. Um, we, uh, we feel good when we kind of are proven right. Like we say, oh, I bet this good guy is going to beat him. We might not know how. We might think it's in jeopardy for a little while. But when that's proven right, we feel good. This is one of the ways that we examine what we've learned. It's kind of like a scientist. We make a prediction, and we see whether the outcome matches the prediction, and then we feel good if we got it right. Um, but we like to be surprised about it. We like to be surprised about some element of the way it came to pass. So there's the term surprising but inevitable. That's how you like your story turns to be. You like it to be the inevitable outcome that the good guy will win, but you're really surprised at how it happens. And you want them to doubt for a moment that it's going to happen, but eventually the outcome will prove them right. Um, now, let's see. Um, when something unexpected happens, there are lots of studies about uh, monkeys and babies and things along those lines doing basic things like they drop a ball and it should fall down and sometimes it goes up. Like they have a magnet in it, flip it on it, and it goes up. When this happens, like if they just drop the ball and it falls, the monkey, the baby will lose interest in it and wander away. But if it goes up, then they're like, what? And they just love it. They're fascinated by it. They can't stop. This is what's called a gap. Um, this is gap theory. Um, so it's there's a gap in our knowledge. It, it provides this hmm, there's a hole, and uh, and it's and, and we want to figure out what the heck is going on. Um, there's a uh, I, I was looking for it here at the beginning and I couldn't find it. Uh, there's this book, um, Dean Koontz, the good guy, and it's got this great story turn at the beginning, um, where there's it's a case of mistaken identity at the beginning. I'll spoiler the first chapter for you. A guy's sitting at a bar. A guy comes up and believes him to be somebody else. He's like, I'll play with him for a minute. The guy slides him a picture and says, uh, it, and, and picture it in an envelope. He's like, here's 5,000. Um, now you get the, the other half when she's gone. And he's like, whoa. And it all of a sudden just jumps. And then we've got this question, who is this? What's going on? And so he sits there for a few minutes, and the guy eventually gets up and leaves. And we know he's supposed to be pulling a hit on this woman for, for $10,000. And he has her name, her address, everything like that. Um, this other guy comes in, sits down at the bar uh, after, after the first guy left. And... Uh, and he's talking to the same character who's sitting there. You know, he tucked this envelope in his $5,000. He's like, I should call the cops. He's just still kind of in shock. And this this other guy comes in, looks a lot like our main character. And he's like, ah, there you are. So uh, I'm guessing you're the guy. And he's like, yeah, I'm the guy. And turns out, yeah, he's the killer, the, the guy who was supposed to be the killer. 
um, the guy who's there to find out who he's supposed to kill, all that other kind of stuff. And, and he pretends he's just like, yeah, I, uh, I called off the hit. I, I decided not to do it. I, whatever. And then the guy gets up, uh, the, the killer gets up and leaves. The hired killer's like, well, okay, whatever. So he gets up and leaves. And uh, our main character goes and follows him and sees him get into his police car and drive away. So this guy who was called the, uh, for the hit is, is a cop. And we don't know what's going on. We've got all of these gaps. Who's this person who's supposed to be killed? Uh, why is, is a cop involved? How, how deeply does this go? All these other things that, that create gaps. And we want to be able to resolve those. We want to learn. And um, so we, we go through it and we, we follow it all um, through. Now the problem is if we have too many gaps, um, if we have no idea what's going on. I mean, if we... Uh, there, this happens a lot with like uh, fantasy novels. Um, they refer to a race that we don't know, a world that we don't know, a magic system that we don't know. It's like, um, Grok was only 17 when the Snorlax took over his uh, his nation. Their Lorganax ringing in the sun. And none of these words mean anything. Um, these, this is too much, too many gaps. Uh, after a little while, we just kind of give up hope. We don't have enough information to begin in, to fill in some of these gaps. Um, so you build a little bit of confidence in your reader. If you provide them with a few gaps at first, and then fill in one or two, you always want to leave a gap, leave something that they need to be reading in order to resolve. Um, whether or not they're supposed to, like there are a lot of stories that have major twists uh, that come to the point where um, the the crisis or what you thought was the crisis of the story isn't even close and it's the, the conflict that is truly driving the story is something else. But along the way, you need them to have some gap, some red herring crisis that they're resolving. And if they resolve that and the story's still going, that's a problem. They don't have any gaps to keep reading for. Um, okay. And lastly, uh, we read for variety. Uh, we read because we don't like to feel the same thing all the time. The more we feel the same emotion, uh, the less significant it is, the less impact it has on us. The more our emotions vary, the more our senses, our experiences vary, the more vivid each one seems because we have something to contrast it to. Uh, this is why the, the most likely uh, type of depression to drive a person to suicide is bipolar depression. Because you're either super high and super happy, or super, super low. But the lows feel a lot worse because of the highs in comparison. A unipolar depression, they're usually kind of okay. They're not really chipper people to be around, but the people who just kind of, they're always depressed, eh, it doesn't feel as bad to them as it would to someone who goes up and down. So we read to have varied experiences, to have varied emotions, to make our own lives seem more vivid and also to relax from our own lives. We spend so much time in our own troubles, our own problems. We all know about the escapism aspect. Um, so we read for the variety. Um, in that note, make sure that your book is not all one thing or another. Make sure that you have variety within the book. You'll make each part of the book seem more vivid. Like in going back to the good guy, um, Dean Koontz is an amazing author. He's probably a better author than I'll ever be, uh, but I feel like he does have a problem with this book. It's super adrenaline almost all the time. The pauses and, and breaks in between the action is very brief and very tense. And uh, he, he doesn't put enough breaks in that you don't totally get bored with it. Uh, but if, if it's hyper action all the time, then it really just loses its charm. You, you start to uh, lose concern because it's, it's been action the entire time. There's nothing nothing new from page to page. You know, it doesn't come and go. You don't expect to be surprised by anything because, oh look, here's more action. Oh look, here's more crisis. Oh look, here's more action. So the breaks are, are, are very important. Have a moment to kind of come down after after the excitement um, or a moment of happiness to, to counteract all the misery. You overload a reader on too much of something, they're going to get exhausted by it and just, just leave it alone. Now, so this story being a pile of information that our, our subconscious subcortices like to attack and, and learn what they can from each bit of each type of story. Learn a new perspective on things, or what if the world was like this? Well, if the world was like this, then people would act this way, and that teaches us something about ourselves as human beings. So this pile of information, we need a way to navigate through, we need a way to figure out, and so that's why we have a story and we follow characters through a story. 
that gives us and our minds a way to digest all this information, a way to pick it apart. So, what do we look for in in uh, in characters that we follow? Why do we like them? Why do we follow them? Um, Brendan Sanderson does a really great job of outlining outlining this. By the way, if you if you want to learn from Brandon Sanderson. I highly recommend the podcast Writing Excuses. Uh, it's him with three other authors that are just phenomenal. They're only 15 minute long episodes, but they pack an immense amount of really amazing information into them. Um, also, uh, I'll try to post a link later, uh, but uh, Brandon Sanderson uh, videotapes his classes and puts them online. Um, and they're, they're really phenomenal. He's an amazing teacher and very entertaining. Um, so, what we look for in a protagonist, uh, we need to, I, people often say you need to relate to a character, and that's it in some way. We need a viewpoint from which we can understand a character and a reason why they're interesting. Um, so the first thing that Brandon says is make your protagonist protag. Um, now I do want to kind of put a little stipulation. Uh, there are lots of characters in a book, and they have lots of different reasons for being there. You have your main character, and there are lots of different ways to define them. I'm just going to talk about the way I'm defining them right now. Um, your protagonist is essentially your hero. They're the one who's leading the cause of what's good, um, or the cause that we're supposed to be rooting for. Uh, then you sometimes have a different character who's your main character, possibly, or your viewpoint character, at least. Uh, for example, uh, Sherlock Holmes, he's, you could say the protagonist, of the stories, I mean, the adventures of Sherlock Holmes, but he's not really, I would say, the viewpoint character, the character whose head we're in and whose, through whose eyes we see the world. Um, the the viewpoint character would be Watson. See, Holmes is too good. He's too competent. Too competent. Uh, we don't get growth from Holmes because Holmes is just always amazing. So if your protagonist, if the hero of your story, is too amazing probably shouldn't be your viewpoint character. We need to feel that they can grow. Um, so, first of all, make your protagonist protag. Uh, I saw on, on one of the uh, the other ones, I'm sorry, I don't remember whose, whose it was, um, that it was talked about you uh, You don't want to have a passive character that things just happen to. Um, for example, I saw, I, I recently finished a book, I don't want to say it because this is a non-example, I'm saying don't do this, and I don't like to slander other people, but I read this book where there was this... Uh, this kind of doom, uh, this uh, countdown, this deadline, a time off. He had to fight a duel to the death at this specific time, and uh, and he kept trying to get out of it, and he kept trying to prepare for it, and a whole bunch of other different plots that he had. And then we follow him through each one, and we're wondering how he's going to get out of this because he's not prepared, and none of his plans have worked. And, and getting to the point, he's, bring, he's brought into the thing, and he even likes the person he's about to fight and kill, and... And how are they going to get out of this? Because they're being forced. They'll both be killed. Yada, yada, yada. The world, of the world hangs in balance. Uh, the fate of the world hangs in the balance. And all of a sudden, a crack in the earth opens up, and all the dead heroes of the past come pouring out. And they say to the, to the people that are forcing them to do this, you have broken this ancient oath, and we're going to kill you all unless you stop it right now. Um, because this duel to the death is, is against this, this ancient oath, this ancient covenant, and, and yada, yada, yada. And so... The bad guys say fine, and, and they get out of it. Nothing that the hero did resolved the conflict. The hero did not protag. The protagonists seem to be this army of, of heroes of the past ages. And so I, I felt like, like, I, like I was shortchanged. Like I just wasted a whole bunch of time. Why did I spend all this time getting to know this other guy who didn't really do resolve anything in the story? I wasn't following behind the protagonist the whole time. The protagonists were introduced at the very, very end. And it was just, ah, I wanted to follow the active person, the person who made a difference, uh, either from their own eyes or from the eyes of a, a less perfect friend near them who's watching them going, wow. Um, so, um, second, they need to be competent. Now that, the hero of this book I'm referring to, was. He, he did do a lot of things and he did them very well. Uh, we need to not be frustrated the whole time, feeling like, gah, if I was in this story, I'd just say, dude, forget it, I'll do it. Um, if I feel that I could resolve this situation a whole lot easier and a whole lot better than the main character every single time he comes up against something, eh, I'm, I'm going to really lose interest in the story quite quickly. 
Um, uh, the, the competence can be, uh, they know a whole lot about a specific thing. It can be like a, uh, intelligence or specialization. It can be uh, physical ability. It can be, um, it, it can even be humor. If they're competent at being really funny. Uh, for example, Arthur Dent in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, he's incompetent in almost every way. But he's competent at being human, and he's competent at humor. And so he's a sympathetic character. We like him. Um, and they need to have heart. They need to be willing to face an issue. Um, reluctantly or not, <laughs> they need to do it. They need to protag. They need to be able to be willing to make the right call, make sacrifices uh, for, for the cause of, of what we think they should do. Um, they need to be passionate about something. Uh, they can love someone, uh, and that tells us that they're human because they feel empathy for another human being. And so it's like, hey, I, I, can, I can get that. I can follow that. Um, or they need to be passionate about a cause. Um, and it needs to be a cause that I can understand being passionate about. If they're passionate about collecting bottle caps, that's probably not enough to make them a sympathetic character for me. It's adorable, but, you know. And I would recommend make, it, make them more than one dimension. Have, make them be passionate, maybe not uber super zealous, but passionate about a number of different things. Um, for example, there are a number of characters in books that are usually not that well written. Uh, it's a common character that, uh, that you'll come across that is extremely passionate about food, and they're always hungry. And every line that comes out of their mouth is supposed to be funny because it's about food. But after a while, there's no gap there. It's completely predictable. 100% predictable. Um, not surprising, but inevitable. It's just inevitable. They're going to open their mouth and say something about food. And so you, you want to give them a little bit more depth, a little bit more dimension than that. Um, now, you need to not just have a good protagonist. You need to have a good antagonist. And a villain that will keep us involved and keep us compelling. We look for a number of different things uh, to, to hate them. <laughs> uh, we need to believe that they can win. Some type of competence in the villain. Um, there's a... Hmm, I was going to say the name of it. I'm not going to. Uh, there, there was a, a series that I read recently, and it was well written in a lot of other ways. Uh, and so it did keep me involved because a lot of the characters were very sympathetic. Um, but um, it was very good at drawing you in emotionally. But intellectually, I did not believe this villain. Uh, this villain kept on making the stupidest of mistakes. She was supposed to be really smart, really manipulative, really uh, on top of it, and, and puppet master pulling all the strings at once. But every single time that the good guys got away, it was because she did something blindly stupid and totally out of character. She took it on word that person X was killed when she didn't see it, and she'd constantly been demanding and making sure that every bit of evidence, every scrap, every bit of proof, she knew exactly what was happening everywhere. But this one, she's just like, oh, you said you killed the person. Okay, that's it. And then so the good guys got away, and, and you know, just that kind of incompetence, it was a ding against the book. Now this isn't the only thing that's going to keep a person reading, because I, I enjoyed the series as a whole. Um, but this villain was competent part of the time, but all the rest of the time I'm like, that's the most idiotic move you could possibly make. So they need to have competence of some kind. We need to believe that they can win. But this one was stupid at just the right moments uh, in ways that was out of character. And that is not a competent villain, one that I believe could win, because they're just going to make another convenient mistake at a convenient moment, and the good guys are going to win. And I'm not even wondering anymore how it's going to happen, because I, it's like I said, inevitable, not surprising. Now, um, so they, they can be intelligent, or they can be really strong, really fast. They need to have some kind of competent edge over the heroes. Um, and they need a reason why we dislike them. Uh, they have a perspective or a worldview that's flawed, so they have a goal or aim that is, in our view, atrocious. I mean, often chaos or death or destruction or control or you know they have whatever their aim is it's one that we believe will will ruin things um, be it a world or, or one particular individual's life whatever it be um, a perspective that's flawed they need to have an unjustified hatred 
or an unjustified indifference that is applied to either a protagonist or someone or something that we care about. Um, so they need to, I mean, most of us, if we see a human in distress, we feel something inside. We kind of feel a pang. If we see them, see someone in distress, and either laugh or just not care, uh, for example, um, Nizka in, in Firefly, um, he is introduced, <laughs> and there's this dead guy hanging from the ceiling that he's just finished having someone torture and kill. This guy, you know, and uh, um, so he kind of pulls the door across, and he's like, oh, I'm sorry. My wife's nephew at dinner, I'm getting earful. So it was his wife's nephew, and we would expect him to feel something. But what this shows us is the only part of him that cares about this death is that his wife is going to get mad at him at dinner because he killed her nephew. That kind of indifference, just completely unjustified indifference, it would be justified to be completely appalled at what just happened. This guy was tortured, brutally, and murdered. But this instantly makes us not like him because instantly we, we find that he doesn't care about at least one other person. And that kind of callous, ugh, we, we don't like it. Um, or unjustified pure hatred um, is, is another way to do it. Um, like an exaggeration of uh, uh, taking pleasure in other people's distress. There's an uh, indespicable me, a little child walking along, and the ice cream cone falls off. And, and so to make the child happy, he makes a balloon animal, and then he pops it in front of the child. So Because the child thought, hey, I'm going to get a balloon animal. But he did this intentionally just to disappoint the child because that made him happy. That kind of thing, yeah, that's that's one of the other types of things that'll, that'll do it. Uh, growth isn't really necessary for a villain, uh, but for the hero, it is. Um, we need to, uh, uh, in the hero, we need we need to have flaws, which are different than handicaps. A handicap is the inability to do something, uh, which is sometimes beyond their control, sometimes we need to grow to overcome. A flaw is something more personality-ridden, uh, character-wise. Uh, some weakness in themselves, some naivete, or, or um, a way that they don't quite see the world right either, which is part of the parallelism in between the, the protagonist and the antagonist. They both need to be competent. They both need to have some kind of way that they see the world differently. But one of them needs to grow to overcome it, and the other one doesn't. Either he's unwilling to sacrifice, or he uh, he's just too rigid, just whatever it is. Um, and the character and the villain both need to be proactive. They both need to act upon the world, not just wait for the world to resolve things on its own. It's not nearly as exciting if we're watching someone survive an earthquake by mere chance. Um, or, you know, someone, you can't really do the Holocaust by pure chance, but, you know, um, Hitler very much made an impact on the world, and yeah, he's someone that we hate. Um, but the character, the, the main character, uh, the protagonist, rather, needs to grow. Um, the viewpoint character needs to grow as well, although uh, the growth doesn't need to be as final in the end, unless the viewpoint character and the, uh, the, the protagonist are the same. Now, um, there, there are lots of ways that we can express who our hero is and, and trigger a reaction inside our reader. As our reader begins to read the book, they look for a lot of different cues and a lot of different clues. How this character feels about everyone else is a huge aspect. Um, how this person feels about, or how everyone else feels about this person is another way to do it. We as human beings are pack animals, we're social animals, and we rely on a whole lot of cues uh, from other people to help us understand how to view the world. Uh, there's the saying, wise people learn from their mistakes, super wise people learn from other people's mistakes. And so as a reader, when, when we're reading, we're learning, and we're learning from other people's mistakes, from other people's lives, and we take cues in that. Not just of the main character, but of everyone else around them reacting to things. Um, for example, there's, there's this thing that I always used to do. Hang on a second. I don't know where it is. So um, I, I served a, a, this is LDS beta readers. I'm assuming I can talk about LDS things and people know what I'm talking about. Um, I served a mission in, in Rome, Italy. And everywhere you'd go, there are these squares that are just flooded with pigeons. They're just everywhere. And I'd walk out, I'd, we, we call this the Great Pigeon Master Trick. You walk out, you pull out your keys, and you jingle them. And that gets the attention of a couple of pigeons near you, but a lot of them will just ignore you and continue to peck in the cobblestones looking for food. And then you throw your keys up in the air. And one of them that sees it 
they have this instinct whenever they see something fluttering into the air they think it's another bird it just triggers that within them and they fly away now when any other bird sees that bird fly off it'll also take off so i throw it and it's just this almost it, it's a chain reaction but it's almost instant just all of them poof, they take to the air one of them has recognized a threat and so all of them run from that threat humans do this too we do it a little more complex uh, of a way um, but we also do it. So if you want someone to be afraid of something, if you want your reader to be afraid, show them other people being afraid of this thing in the book. And really delve into that fear, how it feels emotionally, how it feels physically. Uh, heart beating faster, breathing faster, all the show don't tell ways of, of showing fear. Um, have us be able to just absolutely taste that moment and you'll be afraid. Um, the main character in um, The Call of Cthulhu by Lovecraft um, doesn't see Cthulhu, uh, I think, ever. Yeah, doesn't even see Cthulhu in the short story. And so we're in his head, but as he, we go through the story, he runs into all these other people who have run into aspects of Cthulhu or aspects of Cthulhu's cult, things to do with Cthulhu, and it just terrifies us. Because we see how these people are afraid of it. And he just really, it grips us. And we feel terrified. So, um, <laughs> here's an example. I'm going to uh, show my desktop. I'm sorry, it's going to get really weird here for a second. Because it's going to have a little bit of an infinite loop, loop over there in the corner. Okay. Alright. Um, I'm going to... I'm going to play this little video clip and uh, look at this guy and the cues that he gets. Um, watch uh, to, to see his reaction and, uh, and uh, no, intro no, no more introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I showed that clip for, for a, well, it showed two guys. It's a Japanese prank show. Sorry, I did a poor job of introducing that. Japanese prank show. Um, and these guys just do random things around random people and watch how they react. There's like a hundred of them. And so in this case, they were just running in panic down this street. And the first guy doesn't even look around to see what they're running from. All he knows is people are running, and therefore he needs to run too. So he turns around and takes off. The next guy doesn't. He's evolutionarily... Uh, deficient. <laughs> um, so he, he just continues on walking. Now the funny part is that that first guy is your reader. They are going to take those cues and they're going to react that way. Uh, the second guy is more likely to be your protagonist. He doesn't just react to what's going on. He chooses his actions and, and has, um, he I guess forces more of, of his will into the situation than allows it, the situation to dictate his actions. Um, so there you have it. Um, so we can do it with fear. Uh, we see other people running in fear, um, or we we hear someone else describing their fear in a specific circumstance, or or uh, we, you know, the main character, the viewpoint character, is talking to someone, and all of a sudden their eyes light up with fear, and that tells us that there's something going on, um, and they run screaming, because if if the main character is being that second person and not reacting to all the fear not feeling as much of the fear, or suppressing the fear, or doing something else, it's difficult to get your reader to feel that thing that the hero doesn't, or the the, uh, the viewpoint character doesn't. So if you want to know about it, uh, or, or for example, the unreliable witness, so like you have a viewpoint character who doesn't think that they're beautiful, or who doesn't think that they're competent, and you want to be able to show that, show other people reacting to how they look, or show other people reacting to how competent they are. Um, this is wonder. Um, like uh, if a world is amazing, but you know you're uh, like a, a fantasy world. Your setting is amazing, but your main character grew up there, so they're not going to experience wonder. This isn't brand new to them. Uh, and there's this gimmick that they often use of the newcomer. 
So we explain everything to the newcomer. It's an easy way to get exposition. But it's also a great way to show how amazing this place really is. And it's a great way to uh, express something about your viewpoint character if they don't think it's amazing. It helps us to get to know who they are. Um, or like like I said, the competence thing. Um, in uh, Brandon Sanderson's uh, Stormlight Archives, there's a, a character named Kaladin. And when we first see him, it's from the eyes of this this other guy. He's, he's the viewpoint character for a lot of the book. Uh, definitely one of the main protagonists, one of the main characters. Um, but the first time that we see him, we're not in his head. Um, we're in the head of a new recruit in this army that he's in, and then we see him dive into battle with this spear, and we just feel the wonder inside this new recruit. Then when we get inside Kaladin's head, you see that Kaladin doesn't think he's all that. Um, he knows he's good with a spear, but he doesn't really know how good. And so we don't really get that unless we see someone else reacting to how amazing it is. Um, let's see. <laughs> Sorrow is, um, is, is another good one. We see people reacting in, in deep, tragic, emotional ways. Um, and it can be, like I said, a viewpoint character or, or someone else around that. Um, we take our cue that this is the time to be sad. You can watch people do this visually when you're telling them a sad story. Now, to be fair, women do this better than men do. <laughs> um, men don't, we don't show as much on our faces about what we're thinking. On average, there are exceptions, I know, um, but on average we don't. Uh, for example, as I was learning about this, I was uh, taking psychology classes and we were talking about body language. And we're talking about facial mirroring. If you tell a woman a sad story, first of all, she's going to maintain more eye contact. Um, men tend to see this as either a challenge or really being aggressive. Women just see this as connecting personality-wise. Once again, this is averages. Um, and uh, I began to notice that my face, you can tell it's usually smiling. And people tell me a sad story, I sometimes forget to update my face on what I'm feeling at the moment. So my natural face is a smile. And so they're telling me about how their dad died, and I'm just like, that's really terrible. And I don't didn't react that way. So I began to pay attention to that. And it was true. When I started telling a girl about a sad story, their face would get very concerned, and they'd show sadness on their own face. Um, and so I started to do that to help people understand, yeah, I'm on the same page with you here. Um, but uh, <laughs> by the way, this is a, a good... Um, a good technique to get yourself in the right mood to write something. Edgar Allan Poe was famous for putting on the expression of the character that he was writing to try to feel that. Um, in, in therapy, we call this biofeedback. If you're not happy, pretend you're happy. Act like you're happy. Talk like you're happy. Put your face in a happy face, and then you feel that way. So if you want to know how a character feels when they're angry, make an angry face. If you want to know how a character feels when they're scared, make a scared face. Start breathing faster. Uh, you're scanning, looking for, for whatever is about to attack you. Just do that for a minute or two, and you'll start to feel some of that. Not all of it, but some. Um, anyway, my point is um, that when you when you see people doing that, you'll react that way. It also works with joy. Uh, it also works with affection and trust. If you see someone loving your, your character, then you think, hey, they must be worthy of being loved. It's really fun to do this with villains, because then you make them more deep and more complex. You make your villain someone that your character, um, so them someone that your readers can sympathize with. You make your villain human, uh, because in the end, pretty much every villain that we ever meet in real life has some redeeming quality. They're human as well. And most villains don't view themselves as such. Most villains aren't actually actively trying to be evil. So if you show the villain going home to his wife that he would do anything for, and loves him and would do anything for him. Then that kind of shakes up our our, uh, our whole situation. Or if we see our main character going home, and their daughter goes "Daddy" and runs to him and to, to greet him, especially if they're children or someone vulnerable, someone that needs protection, uh, someone that looks up to them, something along those lines. If we have someone else admire them, trust them, um, this we take as a cue. This is someone who has an admirable trait. This is someone who can be trusted. Someone who's worth loving. Um, this is like uh, with, with um, Darcy in Pride and Prejudice. Uh, Elizabeth begins to change her mind about him as she sees other people who say, like, like Bingley, for example, he's a wonderful, genial human being, loves everyone, and he absolutely loves Darcy. At first we don't get that. We think it's just because Bingley's an idiot and he doesn't see who Darcy really is. But then we run into a couple more people who are like, yeah, Darcy just saved my life at this one point. Yeah, it's really a pity that such a thing happened to such a great guy like Darcy. And then Elizabeth finally gets to his house and is going on a tour through his house and and she 
meets this this housekeeper who's just like, oh, Master Darcy never had a, a cross word for anyone, such a kind boy, and never never a kind master such as him. And she's like, hmm, maybe I need to reexamine the way that I'm thinking about him. And we kind of do the same thing. At first we disbelieve it, but then we see her start to change her opinion. And we start to think, huh, maybe there is more to Mr. Darcy than meets the eye. Um, and uh, this is also another one in, in what's it called? I Am Not a Serial Killer uh, by Dan Wells. Um, a really, really great book. It's about a sociopath. Um, now, people, when they say psychopath, they usually mean sociopath. A psychopath doesn't feel regret. A sociopath does not feel empathy for people. So you can watch someone in pain and have pretty much nothing happen inside of them. And they're screaming and writhing. So usually they seek what is their own good because they can't feel anything when good things happen for other people. Most of us, we give a child a cupcake and we feel good because they're happy. They don't have that. They don't reflect any of this kind of emotion. They often think as other, of other human beings as it in natural pronouns. And it's just like, this is a really unlikable person because we don't see them caring about anyone else. So, um, and, and how they treat others, we think to ourselves in some subcortex, might be how they treat us. So we don't feel like we want to get to know this person at all. But this main character, this viewpoint character, protagonist, just the guy, is a sociopath. And he's trying not to become a serial killer. What makes us like him is, yeah, he's funny, he's smart, uh, so there's the competence aspect, uh, and competent in humor, and, um, and, and in intelligence. And we see that he believes very much in not becoming a serial killer. He wants to do what's right. He doesn't want to do it because he doesn't want to hurt people, but he, he wants to do what's right, and what's right is important to him. Now that's good, but the thing that really clinches it is very, very early on, as we're introduced to this character, and he's just walking around not really caring how other people are feeling because it doesn't impact him, um, he, we, we see his mom and how much his mom loves him. We see his older sister and how much his older sister loves him. We see his aunt and same thing. We see the girls at school and how much they respect him and keep flirting with him, trying to get to know him, and he doesn't really get a lot of social cues. <laughs> um, so he doesn't really understand that that's happening. But we see all these people that care about him, that are invested in him, that think he's a worthwhile human being. And that helps us to, to get excited about him. Um, now, uh, there's, there's a thing about human beings, and this is both in writing how your characters act and in interacting with your reader. Um, we, we tend to be invested in other people and interested in their interests, in their best interests. Um, when, when we feel like they care about other people, uh, when we feel like we know we can trust them to, to interact somewhat altruistically. Uh, Dale Carnegie and How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's a really interesting book to read to understand how people react to things, how people work and think about things. But there's one thing that he does wrong. And he says all people are always selfish. They want what is good for them, and that is it. And, and you know, they don't, they don't care about what's good for you. But then he contradicts himself at one point when he says, like, if someone's upset at you or, or is really resisting what you want to do, Go in and just absolutely berate yourself, belittle yourself, diminish and condemn yourself in every way possible as violently and vehemently as uh, violently and as vehemently as possible, and then they'll stand up to defend you. It'll be like, I am so sorry that we got your order wrong. We should refund 110 percent of your money. In fact, we shouldn't even be in business if this is the kind of person you just way overdo it um, as believably as you can. And and eventually they're going to go, no, 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 that's okay, that's okay. Um, I just. I don't, I don't even want the refund, just as long as you know that there was a, an order that went wrong, that, you know, that's, that's fine. And they'll stand up and they'll fight for your interests and, and fight for your cause. What the key is, is that they need to know that you care about them at all, that you're interested in them, that you're interested in someone other than yourself. And once they trust you to have good interests at heart, altruistic interests, then, then they'll fight for yours too. Uh, we tend to be awfully defensive because we're told constantly that human beings are horrible, uh, and we tend to honestly believe what we're told. But honestly, most people are altruistic. They just need to know that you are too before they're willing to let that guard down. So, as we come to know characters and like characters, it really helps if we see that they're willing to put other people first. Um, like in, for example, a Mexican standoff. You know, got uh, sorry if that's offensive. It's it's the terminology that's usually used in fiction. You got um, three people, three corners of a triangle. They're all pointing guns at each other around in a circle like in Pirates of the Caribbean, and they're standing there. They're either going to shoot and end up in a big shootout, or one of them will lower his guns. When one of them lowers his guns, what do the others do? They lower theirs too. 
They're just waiting to see that you have their best interest at heart. Once they understand that, they lower their defenses. And they don't need to seek their own interests anymore. They're willing to talk. They're willing to deal. They didn't want to shoot you, or they would have, instead of just aiming and standing in metric and standoff. Um, uh, so it, it helps us when we see that we care about others. Um, let's see. And first impressions are very important. Um, you kind of make a promise as to who a person is close to the point when they're introduced. Now, you can use this to swap this up. You can make someone think that a character is someone that they're not. But you usually don't want to do that with the main character unless it's something that will be compelling, unless that false impression of this person is something that will keep them reading. Um, for example, if we meet a person and they're in the middle of an action sequence, uh, then we know that this is an active person. If we meet a person and they're depressed, we figure that they're a depressive, pessimistic person. If we meet someone when they're happy, we, we decide, okay, this is a happy person, especially towards the beginning of a book. Um, and, and so when you first introduce your character, make sure that it's in a setting where your character can be presented and displayed. Um, the, the first impression that we get of a person is excruciatingly important. Um, it's actually why I have facial hair and why I have a hat. Um, because that first impression, I have a baby face. And if I show up and I look like I'm 15, I mean, I'm, I'm in my mid-30s, but people constantly think I'm 15. Um, and if I show up and I look like I'm 15, people aren't going to take what I say as seriously and with as much weight. Working in the mental health industry, that can be an issue. If I show up and instantly I'm a non-authority because I look like I'm 15 and what can a 15-year-old know about anything? It doesn't matter if they find out later on that I'm 32. That first impression still carries so much weight. So make sure that your first impression is is a good one. Um, if if they have positive, if they have a positive impression, we'll think that they're a positive character. We'll like them. We'll be interested. And we'll want to follow them. If it's negative, if they're sitting there full of self pity, then that'll kind of engender a little bit of sympathy. But we aren't likely to think that this is a very compelling character. Um, all right. I've got just a couple of minutes left, and I wanted to. Uh, I want to finish it up with uh, other ways to to get to know characters. Um, the uh, the interesting thing about humans is we interpret everything through a whole bunch of uh, filters, uh, through a whole bunch of uh, frames, I guess you could say. Um, we kind of lump things together. We we find one or two details that tell us a lot about someone or something. Uh, for example, in uh, in Brandon Sanderson's Alloy of Lost, sorry, I quote him so much. I just had a lot of his books on hand when I was when I was starting this. Um, you know, I, I won't read the first page, but basically it starts out with a guy who's creeping along in the ground, and he's got a gun um, that uh, that he describes in details. Like the barrel of his thirty six was this and that and the other, but luckily it was uh, this type of gun without much play and the yada yada yada. You get to know instantly who he is because of how he's thinking about the situation, how he's viewing everything. Um, if a person is walking along and, and everything they're viewing through a, a really negative lens, we get to know that this is a negative person. It can also uh, tell us a lot about the, uh, the emotional state of the person. Um, there's a, a quick description I would like to uh, read, a couple of them. Um, so like, if I tell you, the box lay in the alley like a forgotten artifact, dog-eared and dented, clusters of mildew uh, adorning the sides. That's a pretty little image, you know, but uh, obviously the guy who's there, or the person who's, who's viewing this, kind of thinks it's lovely and picturesque, uh, picturesque. But if they describe it, the box lurked in the alley, reeking of decay, the tattered open and gaping like a savage mouth. That puts us in a completely different place, and we know something about that person. Right now they're viewing everything as a threat. Um, and that can tell you a lot about who a person is. If I give you a couple of details, like... Um, black fingernail polish, and uh, knee-high steel-toed black leather boots. Um, I tell you this is a woman. You know a lot of details about her that I didn't tell you. Like, she probably calls herself Poison or Raven or something like that. you got a good idea about what type of music she listens to, about if she has tattoos or not, and what type they might be, uh, piercings and how many, um, and her whole demeanor and outlook on life. A couple of very small, well-chosen details can speak volumes as to a human being is. Like, I mean, you look at my bookshelf back here, you haven't been able to see it most of the time, but it tells you a lot about who I am. I've got, uh, I've got Beowulf, I've got, uh, I've got Terry Pratchett and Brandon Sanderson, I've got uh, Jabba the Hutt, I've got a brain, I've got uh, pistols, uh, uh, um, and, and funny old top hats and things like this. 
it tells you a lot about who I am just in describing who a person is or what's around them, what they've chosen to be around them, how they're thinking about the world. Um, and uh, and that's that's an excellent way to, to get to know a character. Um, looks like my time is up. Uh, given to the lag, it's, it's probably been up for a couple of minutes. Uh, so I'm going to close now. Um, I wanted to close with uh, a little bit of a pitch. I recently presented at LTUE um, on schemas, parts of these details that tell us worlds about what's going on inside a person's head and, and how to analyze those, how to use those to communicate the scheme of your whole book, know where you might be missing something, uh, what might not be fulfilling, uh, how to present characters, how to describe really intense objects or, or new aspects of worlds and, and things along those lines. Um, if, uh, let's see, you could go to lucidsense.blogspot.com um, to, uh, to, to see a recorded video of that, as well as I'm going to be posting a whole bunch of other things along the, that, those lines. Or uh, just go to my Facebook profile, Danny Potter, um, uh, or my um, Facebook group, Scrib Leptic Support Group. I'm going to put all that in the notes. So anyway, um, thanks for listening. I'm going to close. The uh, admins have a, a, a video that they're going to show afterwards. Um, and uh, that's all there is to it.